Insomnia is probably the biggest and most well-known one, but it's not the only one. There is restless leg syndrome that is more common in the ADHD population. There is sleep apnea that is more common. And there is the delayed sleep-wake face disorder. So there's a few conditions that can make you sleep so unrefreshing that you just wake up exhausted. The What's Eating You podcast is a series of mental health topics that are designed to make you think, learn, educate, and validate. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to another episode of the What Is Eating You podcast. I know you are going to absolutely love part two of my conversation with Dr. Stoichev. If you haven't heard the previous part, make sure you go back, but he is a licensed naturopathic doctor in the state of California. He has amazing content around ADHD, other mental health topics, and specializes in naturopathic medicine. So without further ado, welcome back to part two of the show, Dr. Thank you so much, Steph. I had so much fun with part one. (laughs) (laughs) I know we could just talk forever and ever, but I am so excited for today because we're going into attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which I know is your passion and what you're super interested in. Is that right? That is definitely correct. Um, Definitely almost all of my patients have it. So I love working with ADHD. Oh, what do you love about it? Oh boy. Um, I think it's because it comes with so many things. Um, the more you learn about it, the more you find out. And um, it just comes with so many, unfortunately, comorbidities like mm. depression, anxiety, substance use disorders. Um, it comes with a lot of physical health conditions. Like I think it was um, earlier this year, I learned that we are at high risk of having migraines. So I was like, whoa, there's just so much about it that someone is suffering with, unfortunately. So I just love supporting it holistically in any way that I can. It's so true. And I feel the same way. I sort of fell into ADHD because I was having expertise in eating disorders. And then Mm -hmm. throughout the pandemic, many women realized they had uh, ADHD. And then I feel I was the only person or one of the first people to put out on social media, there is a massive link between ADHD, BPD, especially eating disorders. So I'm really glad you mentioned the comorbidities Mm -hmm. and everything it comes with because there are a lot of health conditions that you see with it. And I saw this in one of your videos that went viral about the Mm -hmm. iron deficiency. Yes. Gosh, that's so... Um, it's, it's just like, it's something that is so commonly missed. And the reason why it's being missed is because when you go to your doctor or to your healthcare provider, what they do, and I don't blame them for it, is they just order what's called a complete blood count, which looks at your red blood cells, um, but it doesn't look at your iron. So you can have iron deficiency without having anemia. And anemia means low red blood cells or like low, low hematocrit or hemoglobin. Um, so oftentimes if you have iron deficiency, even without the anemia, it's just your ADHD symptoms feel so much worse. Um, it's just such a key player in brain health. Um, and it's just so common. It's so common because a lot of women with or without ADHD do have a lower iron, uh, deficiency or experience that. So yeah, incredible. You, you found that link with ADHD. Can you tell us, okay, from your perspective, what is ADHD and how do you know or what do you see? I mean, you must see it a lot. What commonalities Mm -hmm. do you see, especially with women who have ADHD? Mm -hmm. Yeah. um, So, I mean, the more you do, the more you see the condition, the more familiar you become with, you know, the nuances and like what what you pick up to help you diagnose it per se. So, um, you know, there's the usual like inattention, hyperactivity, which obviously the hyperactivity piece becomes more and more masked maybe with age um, or sort of fades into the background. Uh, But yeah, like the inattention piece, the executive dysfunction, those are like huge. And I see them with almost every uh, patient of mine. And you know, especially with the complex tasks, especially with tasks that are 
uninteresting, boring, and then obviously contrast that with something that they're passionate for. It's like crazy. Um, the difference of how one can flourish if it's something that's interesting versus, you know, something that's not mm. as interesting. So, yeah. Yeah. And when women or men, anyone who comes <laughs> to see you, but especially women, <laughs> Are they aware they have ADHD or a lot of them undiagnosed and they come to you for IBS or another issue and you're like, hey, have you ever thought that maybe you have ADHD? I have definitely had a few cases like that. And I, what I believe the reason is, unfortunately, is that women go undiagnosed or misdiagnosed for years. Um, and that is a, the fault of our healthcare system, unfortunately. Uh, women are much more likely to get an adult diagnosis than men. Men often get picked up in childhood, you know, yeah. because rowdier boys or whatever the reason is, the high, the typical, when you, when people think of ADHD, unfortunately, you get this idea of like a very hyperactive boy that, you know, does crazy things like jumps around and all that stuff. But that is to our downfall because we miss so many people, especially women. With ADHD. Mm, yes, yeah. 100%. It sounds like it's a global thing going on. Phenomenon. Because, oh, it is. It's huge here and yeah. also in the US. So let's go into ADHD. What, mm -hmm. from a naturopathic perspective, you said there's a lot of overlaps, but mm -hmm. what, what do you see and <clears throat> what do you recommend naturopathically for people mm -hmm. with ADHD and why? So as a naturopathic doctor, I look at every condition in a holistic way, which means that we look at all the different factors which can be contributing to making it worse. So you mentioned the iron deficiency, right? So nutrient deficiencies are a big part to, you know, making ADHD symptoms worse. Iron is a big factor. Um, and there are so many other nutrient deficiencies that we could focus on that I have seen clearly make such a huge impact on someone when they're replenished. Mm. So, you know, there's iron deficiency, there is B12 deficiency, there is folate deficiency, vitamin D deficiency. Um, so there's a lot of vitamins and minerals that can play a very important role um, in making sure your ADHD symptoms are optimally managed. Wow. Um, why yeah. is that? Why do people with ADHD tend to have low B12, low vitamin D? I mean, look, they're living in Melbourne. I get the low vitamin D. And if they're yes. perhaps, um, I don't know, especially vegans, I know a lot have to substitute that uh, B12. Correct me if I'm wrong. B12. Mm -hmm. yeah. But why people with ADHD? Is it because they're forgetting to eat? They're not getting these nutrients? Yes, that's a very common uh cause actually the high you know being hyper fixated on something that's interesting that's not food um so forgetting to eat for hours uh, can be a big thing um and you know there's many other causes that can uh, that can do that um, even if you're in a sunny country unfortunately um like myself san diego and you know you mentioned you too um vitamin d deficiency is so common for one mm -hmm. reason or another um, I see it all the time, even in all of my patients from San Diego. So um, we just have to test for it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And do, does being deficient in these vitamins and minerals make you feel tired? Because I want to talk about feeling tired, especially mm -hmm. with ADHD. So many people say, I wake mm -hmm. up exhausted. Why mm -hmm. is that? Is that something else or is it because of these deficiencies? So that has uh, like multiple causes or like multiple etiologies, but deficiencies in nutrients is a big one. So all of the vitamins that we just mentioned, if deficient, can make you feel tired. In fact, that's probably one of the first symptoms. Um, yes, they can make your ADHD symptoms worse. Um, they can also make your depression symptoms worse and your anxiety. So we know that if depression and anxiety are poorly managed, ADHD symptoms are much worse too. So it's like this cluster of things um, in terms of nutrient deficiencies. Uh, but for one reason or another, sleep disorders are much more common with ADHD. Wow. And 
Yeah, um, and there's so many. Uh, insomnia is probably the biggest and most well-known one, um, but it's not the only one. Um, there is restless leg syndrome that is more common in the ADHD population. There is sleep apnea that is more common. Um, and there is the uh, delayed sleep-wake phase disorder. So there's a few conditions that can make your sleep so unrefreshing that you just wake up exhausted. Wow, I didn't even think of that. I knew people with ADHD struggle with their sleep, but I didn't yeah. even think about a comorbid sleep disorder. I'm familiar with yeah. insomnia, hypersomnia, mm-hmm. sleep apnea. But what was that last one you said? Delayed sleep? Sleep-wake disorder. Yeah, what's it's that? A, it, it's a fancy term for a night owl. Um, oh. <laughs> so, yeah, it just basically means that you're much, you much prefer to stay up and like stay later in the night. And unfortunately, for one reason or another, for example, having a job or going to wake up for school, you have to wake up early. So if you think about the fact that you feel like you want to go to bed at 12 or like, you know, midnight, uh, and then you have to wake up super early, then there's this chronic deficiency in hours of sleep. Mm. and you just feel exhausted. Um, and this is much more common in people with ADHD. Um, I think the another common term for it was re- uh, revenge bedtime procrastination, just feeling like you don't Ooh. have enough time in the day, so you just push it as hard as you can. I love that. So, revenge yeah. Yeah. Revenge bedtime but, procrastination. What is that? Yeah. <laughs> it's epic. It's basically the same as this, where like you just feel like there's not enough hours in the day for one reason or another. Maybe you haven't been productive, or maybe you worked all day. Um, and you just push it until the midnight hours because maybe you don't feel sleepy, maybe you feel like I didn't have enough fun, so I want to stay up. And then you have to wake up early the next day, so it just builds up and builds up. I absolutely love that term. And I think this is so good because so many people will say, I'm a night owl. I'm more productive Mm -hmm. at night, but you're telling me there's a fine line between, between being a night owl and having a sleep disorder, depending on how much sleep you're getting in total. Like if you run your own business Mm -hmm. and you can sleep in and wake up at 11, then it's not a disorder. Uh, yes. If it's not impacting your quality of life, or if it's not impacting your mental health, your productivity, then it's not. Um, and usually night owls or people with this condition end up catching up sometimes on the Mm. weekend when you can sleep in. Um, but sometimes it's not enough, especially if you do it chronically. And if, if you have less than seven to eight hours every night, it just catches up to you. It really does. Okay. So the reason, one of the main reasons people with ADHD struggle with sleep is because they're often going to bed late for a multitude of different reasons. It might be that revenge procrastination. It might be mm-hmm. um, maybe they're more productive. Maybe they're hyper fixating on something they enjoy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And for those reasons, they have sleep. Yes. Um, I Gosh, I also hear a very common reason being I just cannot shut off my mind. Yeah. So it's usually, and it's not always anxious thoughts. Sometimes it's just like many thoughts at the same time. It's like five different train tracks happening at the same time. Like my patients tell me like, I have a song going on in my head. I'm thinking about tomorrow. I'm thinking about what happened today. I'm thinking about my food. And and how can you sleep Mm. like that, right? It's like, it really affects your quality of sleep. That is so true because I often think people stay up because they're anxious or they're ruminating, but it's true. You can just have a song (laughs) that you're thinking about, or you can just plan something in your mind and it's not necessarily anxiety, but your, your mind is just noisy. Noisy. That's exactly it. And it's difficult to switch off that noise. I think, um, that's the, that's the issue sometimes with, uh, people who have ADHD is just, there's constant constant noise. Constant. Yes. Yeah. So are there any naturopathic recommendations for people who struggle with sleep with ADHD? Yes. Um, again, it, a little bit depends on the sleep disorder. Um, but if we were to go with maybe the most common one, which is um, insomnia, mm. uh, or which means difficulties falling asleep and or difficulties staying asleep. Um, and usually what we do in that case is 
you know, the good old sleep hygiene can go a long way, um, which part of it could be maybe like blackout curtains or like a sleep mask, um, you know, uh, or shutting off electronics, which is really hard mm-hmm. an hour or two before bed. And now that we're with them all the time. Um, so that's a big one. Keeping your temperature cool in the bedroom is something that not many people know about, but it works so well. Um, mm. Like it's in Fahrenheit, it's 65 degrees. I'm not a hundred percent sure what the conversion is that to Celsius, but um, it's definitely cooler. It's I was going to say that what I think it's 18 degrees here. What Fahrenheit did you say? 65. Let's Google it. Fahrenheit. Yeah, let's do a quick To okay, eighteen. You got it. I got it. Oh, you yeah. googled that so quick. My gosh. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so set your room temperature to eighteen degrees, and I have experimented with this yeah. as well. And I think your room temperature really does have a big impact on your sleep. Yeah. Most people will struggle actually to go straight down to 18 degrees Celsius Mm -hmm. just because it's too cold. Um, So what we do is just we we gradually work ourselves to that. So your body gets used to it. But it makes such a huge difference. Our bodies rest so much more when it's Yes. Yes. Temperature, light, sound. So anyway, you can block all that out. These are all, I guess, the, you know, natural lifestyle type of changes I've yep. recently gotten into, and I don't have uh, ADHD for anyone listening, but I've recently gotten into taking magnesium and zinc at night. Mm-hmm. And I was watching your TikTok and you said things I noticed that got so much worse when I wasn't taking my supplements. And you said your sleep yes. wasn't good when you had missed your magnesium. Tell me a bit about yeah. uh, magnesium and how that can help. Gosh, it's probably one of the uh, most powerful interventions for sleep. Um, especially, uh, if you choose the right form, yes. because there's many different forms of magnesium. Um, but magnesium is like, it's necessary in so many biochemical reactions in our body. It's hard to count and sleep health is one of them. So magnesium is so important for our, for our brains because it can help produce some of the neurotransmitters that we need, like, you know, serotonin, dopamine. Um, but also it helps with the calming neurotransmitters in particular. Mm. So uh, in that way, it can really help with our sleep and it can really help with anxiety, both of which are oftentimes, you know, intermixed with insomnia. So you're almost like addressing all the different aspects of insomnia by doing, um, the Mm. magnesium. So Yes. Yeah. I yes. love that. And it's so true. You've got to get the the proper, I don't know if it's called a clinical grade or um, there's uh-huh. lots of different ones. So just being very mindful where you get your magnesium from. Is there anything people yes. should not buy or anything that tells you a magnesium may not be a good magnesium or for any supplement? Great question. Um, uh, for the magnesium in particular, there's so many different forms and each different form serves a different role or function um citrate is actually a very common one but that one is best used for constipation and for bowel movement support um and oftentimes people complain that magnesium upsets their stomach and that's the reason why because it's citrate um yeah and two of the best ones in my clinical experience for sleep health for anxiety for mental health are glycinate and three in it. Those are the two different forms. And um, they can be so calming. Um, I have people who have just started taking that and changed nothing else. And sleep quality is so much better. ADHD symptoms improve so much more. Mm-hmm. Anxiety levels almost disappear. And I'm like, what? Yes. Because <laughs> yeah. sleep is such an important pillar. And I say a pillar because yes. if it's your mental health, if it's a symptom. There's so many different pillars. There's nutrition, there's psychology, there's functional medicine, whatever it might be. And sleep is such an important part of those pillars. If you don't have your sleep right, everything's going to be out of whack. You're going to crave specific foods that may not have, you know, your best interests. You're going to be more irritable. You're going to be more moody. It's going to affect your executive functioning, which is already 
challenging when you have ADHD. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. So yeah. prioritize sleep, everybody. Um, now, I'm seeing this all over TikTok, but everyone's saying, if you have ADHD, make sure you take lion's mane and L-tyrosine. What are these yeah. and should we all be taking them or is it specific for people with ADHD? Um, you know, um, L-tyrosine, mechanistically, it makes a lot of sense because L-tyrosine is an amino acid um, that we need, really, um, to produce dopamine and norepinephrine. So those are the two main neurotransmitters that are believed to be insufficient or deficient in um, ADHD. So in theory, you know, providing the L-tyrosine should help because you're providing the building blocks um, for ADHD. And I have seen that work um, in some occasions, actually. Um, with L-tyrosine, maybe the effect is not as profound, obviously, as stimulants or as other medications for ADHD, but I have seen it work somewhat well. Um, of note, with L-tyrosine, some people get some nausea or gastrointestinal upset, so that would be something to be mindful of and definitely important to talk to your doctor because mm. it may interact with some medications. Um, so, you know, always good to check in with them. Um, so that's with L-tyrosine. Lion's mane, it's uh, sort of, it's a mushroom and it's one of those medicinal mushrooms that we're still learning more and more about. It, like the research is in its infancy. Mm. It's believed to work um, as like a, it's called a nootropic, which is basically a chemical which improves like nerve function, focus, uh, executive function, um, and sort of like a crude mechanism in which it's believed to work is like it, it improves blood flow to the brain. So that way it gets more nutrients. It gets, you know, all the necessary building blocks for mm. their neurotransmitters to flourish. Um, so that's why some people see a really good um, result from lion's mane. Right. So in summary, you're saying L-tyrosine is about the amino acids that we need that helps with our dopamine and norepinephrine, which people with ADHD yeah. have less access to those neurotransmitters. Mm -hmm. And lion's mane is a nootropic, which helps with cognitive function. I feel nootropics mm -hmm. made this big um, I don't know, they were trending over the pandemic, like get your neurotropics and make your brain function. I feel we were sort of in our neurotropic era in the last few years. Yeah, yeah I think so too. <laughs> I think so too. I think it's because they're getting more and more attention in the media and in, in the research field too. So we're discovering more and more about them. And I suspect some of them are going to be probably very helpful in the future, especially mm. as we learn more about them. Yeah. more more research about and even mushrooms mushrooms yeah. are huge at the moment yeah yeah and uh, yeah I'm, I'm not sure if you're talking about medicinal or like actual psilocybin yeah ones, but yeah what's the deal yeah. like these aren't these obviously aren't you know magic mushrooms that you're yeah. talking about in lion's mane but yeah what's the difference like what makes a mushroom magic and not magic Great question. So it's usually the psilocybin content, which is the active ingredient um, in the mushrooms that mm -hmm. does make it magic. And it gives it its hallucinogenic properties. Um, and, you know, there's more research coming out, especially for like psilocybin assisted psychotherapy and, yes. uh, you know, how that can be helpful for like processing trauma and treatment resistant depression and all that stuff. So um, who knows? what we will um yeah I, I think at this point in time the unfortunate thing is that the psilocybin content is not standardized in the product so you don't know what you're getting so you're probably taking a risk wow <laughs> yes. yeah um but yeah don't buy your mushrooms on ebay <laughs> yes definitely not <laughs> well maybe i mean you can but I love that. And you're yeah. so right. We are just on the tip of the iceberg. And here in Australia, uh, psilocybin treatment is in its um, early stages. I believe it's yes. just been approved for working with um, trauma 
clients. So that's Mm -hmm. a really interesting thing. We can do a whole other episode on on that. Um, Also, since we're on this train of, I guess, substances, I did a video on cannabis and ADHD and it went viral. A lot of people liked it, but a lot of people were coming at me saying, you Mm -hmm. know nothing about it. Um, There's different strains of cannabis. Mm -hmm. And people are like, well, my doctor prescribes me legalized cannabis. Where do you sit with the whole cannabis and ADHD theme trend? It's not really a trend, but is it a growing area? Tell me a bit about that. It is. I, I've definitely been hearing more about cannabis and ADHD, cannabis and all the other conditions too, physical and mental health. Um, uh, in California, it's not within my scope to, pres- to prescribe it like medicinally, um, mm-hmm. but I always ask about substance use in my patients. So like mm-hmm. I find out if they're taking cannabis. So what I can say for sure is that the research is mixed and scarce um, so what we know for sure is that there is a high risk of substance use disorders in yeah. people with ADHD. So that might sometimes the drug of choice is cannabis or marijuana. And sometimes um there is, you know, the connection as well that you know, people with ADHD use cannabis for different reasons mm. from my experience. So I oftentimes ask them, like, what is your, you know, reason and rationale? Sometimes it's to manage pain. Other times it's to improve sleep quality. Um, mm. Other times it's like a tool to like escape when they're feeling overwhelmed, like with tasks or with something like that. Um, and, but yeah, I think the most common reason why I hear people with ADHD utilizing cannabis is for sleep issues. So, you know, to shut off their mind the, what we were talking about, like the five different mm. tracks going on. Um, so yeah, I think that's a very common reason for people to yes. use that. And if they are using cannabis to sleep, is there anything apart from, you know, magnesium that you'd recommend? Like, is there anything they can, because obviously in psychology, we want to substitute potentially maladaptive coping with adaptive coping. So the issue is what I was getting to with that video was cannabis, when people are commonly using it with ADHD, because like you said, there's high substance use disorder, comorbidity, yeah. it's not um, managed. The amounts aren't managed. Whereas I think if it's prescribed, that's a very different ballpark versus different story. I'm going to self-medicate with this. So mm-hmm. yeah, what can you recommend for people who may be essentially quote unquote self-medicating with Mm -hmm. cannabis? I would maybe figure out the why, like what is driving that? Like what is, is it poor sleep? Is it anxiety? Is it overwhelm? Um, Because there's usually almost always a reason unless it's genuinely recreational and it's for fun Mm. um, and address that. So if, there are sleep issues, like you said, magnesium can be a huge part of it. Um, you know, there's, um, you're probably familiar with it. There is like sleep, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy or like CBT for insomnia. That's extremely effective for, uh, mm. insomnia and sleep conditions. So that works. Oftentimes it's better than medications even. So, you know, just fixing the reason why someone um, needs the cannabis, especially if it's like a, a maladaptive, maladaptive reason or like something that's not, you know, serving them. Yeah. I love that. Identify the need yeah. and see if we can replace it with something a bit more effective that doesn't have risk of, you know, overdose yeah. or risk of, um, increasing your anxiety. Is there mm-hmm. anything else with ADHD in women you think we should know when it comes to naturopathic approaches? Um, ADHD in women, yes, um, definitely um, making sure you get those levels checked of uh, the vitamins and the minerals just to make sure there aren't any deficiencies um, and definitely taking into account the hormone health piece just because um, those can have such a profound impact on mm. ADHD symptoms. It's, it's unbelievable. Like, um, 
for example, the transitions in life, like perimenopause, menopause, um, can be huge. And there's mm. hormone fluctuations and women with ADHD report that their symptoms are all over the place during that, you know, during those years. Or if there is something like PMDD or premenstrual dysphoric disorder, the ADHD symptoms are much, much worse during that one week or one and a half weeks before menstruation comes. So making sure hormones are in a healthy, balanced place can be so important. Yes, incredibly important. And I've got a question from a viewer and they said, this may sound stupid, but could the ADHD imbalance cause a fertility issue? Could I be lacking something hormonal? So that's a great question. Um, Fertility is not my area of expertise. So I don't, like I usually refer to colleagues who specialize in fertility. Um, I don't suspect there is a direct link in terms of like ADHD causing infertility, but it, there may be an indirect link um, in the sense that maybe if the ADHD is really poorly managed, then nutrition habits are, you know, out of whack. So like there's nutritional deficiencies or insufficiencies that can, you know, decrease risk of pregnancy. Um, sorry, decrease the like, like likelihood of becoming pregnant. Um, so yeah, I would say if the ADHD is very poorly managed to the point of affecting your nutritional status and or your hormone balance, mm. then it could potentially lead to a pregnancy, uh, you know, trouble issues. So yeah. Yeah. It can indirectly mm. impact it. Yes. Thank mm -hmm. you for that question. And I guess the final mm -hmm. area I want to cover in this podcast episode, because we know uh, people with ADHD have lower, le is it lower levels of nor epinephrine or dopamine, or is it less access to that? Because sometimes people will say it's not that they uh, they don't have dopamine or serotonin or you know nor epinephrine. Mm -hmm. Can you just clarify that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the confusion comes from the fact that they're very difficult to measure. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, um, I, yes, I just think we don't have the research to confirm for sure. Uh, and like there are, there is a blood test, for example, for dopamine levels, but it doesn't really correlate with brain levels of dopamine. Um, so yeah, I, th I think it's hard for us to say whether it's like a true deficiency, like we have an absolute lower level of those neurotransmitters mm. or like a lower availability. Uh, like you said, what we know is that medications, which work by increasing availability of those neurotransmitters work really well, whether that's because of replenishing those neurotransmitters or because of a downstream of effects, like maybe improving neurotrans uh, neuroplasticity or like the, you know, um, the flexibility of those connections in our brain. Mm. We don't 100% know for sure. So, um, yeah, there okay. is some imbalance. Yeah. There is an imbalance. And yeah. they've found interventions which um, allow more access to dopamine really work for people with uh, ADHD. And I think I went down this rabbit hole of can you assess for dopamine? Can you measure it? Yeah. Can you do a test? And, yeah, it's hard to find a clear-cut answer, but I think it was what you said. When you measure dopamine, it doesn't necessarily correlate to the same brain dopamine. Yes, because blood levels and brain levels are vastly different. Um, so I probably wouldn't use that test and there's no cheap way to, to, you know, look into brain levels of dopamine. Um, there is actually a urine test that can test for, um, metabolites of your neurotransmitters. Mm. Um, so it can test for metabolites of your dopamine and serotonin and norepinephrine. Yep. But unfortunately we aren't a hundred percent sure how accurate that is. And it's very expensive. So. Yeah. And it's probably not high on someone's priority list to yeah. <laughs> check their dopamine, but let's just tell me a little bit about what dopamine dopamine is and why are we all obsessed with it all of a sudden? I feel mm -hmm. we are in, and I read this really great book called dopamine nation. Is mm -hmm. it something we need to constantly 
be chasing? Whatever happened to just living and not being obsessed with dopamine? Like, are we in our dopamine yeah. era? <laughs> we might be. Um, I think especially with ADHD, the dopamine chase is real because, you know, for the imbalance or for whatever reason it is, I think it's because of the imbalance or maybe deficiency that, you know, we are predisposed to those substance use disorders. I think the risk from what I looked at the literature, it's like three times as high as someone who doesn't have it. Um, it just, the dopamine rush that comes with that is addicting or addictive. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, you know, there is the impulsivity that comes with uh, ADHD related to most likely the dopamine seeking. Um, so, you know, maybe driving becomes more reckless or, you know, the impulsivity around food, which you're a lot more familiar with than I am, uh, you know, with binge eating disorder or like bulimia nervosa, maybe um, impulsivity around spending and, you know, the dopamine boost that you get from that impulsivity around sexual activity and the dopamine boost you get around that um, the behavioral addictions. So, yeah, mm. it's, yeah. And it's hard to determine. A lot of people ask me, well, it does sound and look like bipolar, especially in a manic or hypermanic episode. In bipolar, it's a mood disorder and people often find themselves excessively spending, shopping, reckless driving, promiscuity, sexual relations, especially when they're in, or only when they're in mania or hypermania, whereas with ADHD, the impulsivity slash hyperactivity is more constant. And the way you can tell the two, because I get this asked all the time, is bipolar sort of has fluctuations in moods, whereas ADHD is quite persistent. So you'd see more persistent impulsivity. Is that right? Do you treat much of yeah. bipolar? Yeah, I I also have patients with bipolar disorder, uh, and I I think the other one that's very very good to have on the differential is borderline personality disorder with the impulsivity piece. Um, but you're right with ADHD, it's like a con like almost like a constant thing, mm. um, and obviously the intensity varies of the impulsivity. But with bipolar disorder, with it's usually clearly um, distinguished in time with the hypomanic and manic episodes. Yes. Um, yes. And of course, the conditions are not mutually exclusive, so you can have both, uh, in which case you would see both those distinct episodes and like a maybe low-level impulsivity the rest of the time. Yeah, okay. Yeah. BPD, oh my gosh. We, we may get into yeah. that, but um, just going back, okay, I get asked this all the time. What are some natural ways I can boost my dopamine or what are some supplements that can help us support dopamine in ADHD or any supplements for ADHD? Yeah, so uh, I mean the magnesium is a great starting point just because um, it is most often deficient in mm. ADHD and like correcting that deficiency can really help with um, improving just the executive function overall. And let's not forget that if we heal our relationship with sleep, then ADHD symptoms are automatically much better. Um, so that's a huge part of, you know, supporting ADHD. Um, I also love using omega-3 fatty acids. So Ooh. those are, yeah, those are the essential type of fatty acids that we can't produce in our bodies. And, um, you know, Food as medicine almost always comes first, right? So uh, fish is a great source of that, uh, the oily fish in particular. What's oily um, fish? New... So oily fish is the fish that is high in um, fat, essentially. And there is a very helpful mnemonic that um, you can go by. It's called SMASH. Smash. And yeah, that helps us sort of like come up with all the oily fish easily. So like it's salmon, mackerel, anchovies, sardines, and herring. So those are the wow. oily fish. Yeah, that are rich in omega-3 fatty acids. I love or, that. Yeah, for the people who are um, eating meat. For those who are vegan, um, there is 
plenty of omega-3 fatty acids in flax seeds and in chia seeds. So the, those are great options for uh, vegan. I love, I love that you helped us with both the vegan and non-vegan options. Yeah. And is it really important where you source your fish from? Because I'll think I'm doing the right thing. I'm having my salmon. And then I go watch Seaspiracy or some movie on yeah. Netflix that's like, stop eating salmon. Um, yeah. Or even tuna. I love tuna, but I know it's high in heavy metals. Mm-hmm. <sighs> How do we navigate that? I felt that sigh. <laughs> um, yeah, so there is, um, you have to, so you can do your best every day, but you also have to remember, and this is your area of expertise, that once you get into that hole, it's like you obviously risk that eating disorder starting to develop. So like, it's almost like you have to try your best to marry both worlds. So is um, wild caught salmon healthier than farmed salmon? Probably. Um, does it have, you know, lower levels of heavy metals and all that stuff? Probably. But at the same time, is it better to have salmon than no salmon? Probably. So, uh, you know, it's like, you have to be gentle and kind with yourself. Yes. Um, yeah. And with fish in particular, fo- the focus being on smaller fish is always a good idea. So salmon is a relatively small fish, especially compared to like shark or like, uh, you know, tuna can be a bigger fish. So, so like that can be um, an issue, but it only becomes an issue if you have it like almost daily and like mm. in high amounts so that the heavy metals accumulate. So if you have it every now and again, it wouldn't be yeah. something that is, you know, yeah. Got it. Why damaging it, per se. Why is heavy metals bad? What does it actually do to you? Sure. Um, so with heavy metals and then, this case in particular with fish, the main concern is mercury. So they can accumulate in your body and they, over time, this is like over time, like years, oftentimes, they cause issues and they can cause a lot of different issues. So it can mm. be issues with fertility, it can be issues with the nervous system. So like headaches, neurological symptoms like numbness and tingling, um, you know, gait issues, gait problems, they can affect your gut health, um, they can affect your liver health. So they have like, you know, this cascade of things they can do. Um, It's just, it usually happens when they accumulate over time. Right. Okay. So what you're saying is try your best. You don't want to become, you know, orthorexic or obsessed with eating clean and pure. So fish Omega-3, and then the original question, <laughs> there's so much Sorry I can ask. No, that was me, is, yes, natural ways to boost dopamine or your musts if you have ADHD, nutritional, naturopathic-wise. Yeah, so um, I also heavily, heavily rely on nutrition, actually. Um, so I almost always recommend um, healthy high fat, high protein meals, and then, you know, like a healthy amount of carbohydrates, just because proteins provide us with amino acids, they're the building blocks for our neurotransmitters. So we need that for our neurotransmitters like dopamine and norepinephrine to be produced. Mm. So that's a big part of it. And um, protein can also help stabilize our blood sugar throughout the day. And in doing that, it can help us with focus and executive function. So if you think about it, if sugar is low or high, we like crash and then we get hyper. So it's like we're riding the train. Mm. Um, so yeah, I heavily rely on nutrition, I have to say. When yes. It comes to improving. Yeah. And, and it, sometimes. it has to, it has to be a priority and then you can start to worry about other things around nutrition. And what about dopamine? How with ADHD, people who crave dopamine and may f- look for it in the wrong places. Yeah. How can they scratch that How itch? How do we deal with that? Yeah. Yes. How do you um, deal with it? <laughs> um, yeah. So some part of it can be done through some of the nootropic herbs. So like uh, there, you know, like you mentioned, lion's mane is one of them. But also I, I've used things like, I'm not sure if you've heard of them, but copa, um, like go to cola. So those are like two herbs 
that can help with sort of like improving blood flow to the brain, but also helping to produce those neurotransmitters. Um, there's another one that recently got so much attention in the media, which is saffron. Um, saffron works really well for ADHD. What? Um, yeah. Um, in How do you take form. it? Do you just, oh, capsule, capsule saffron. And what were the other two? Yeah. Uber. Oh, the uh, one of them is called Bacopa, which is B-A-C-O-P-A. Yep. And the other one is called Go to Hola, which is G O T U K O L A. Go to Cola and Bacoba. Yeah. Yes, they're um, Ayurvedic herbs, I believe, are the origins. Um, so, yeah, those are the classic wow. neurotropic herbs. Yeah. How do you take, so we know saffron you can take in pill form and the bacoba and gut to cola. How, I love that word. How do you take right. those ones? So you can take them in different forms depending on what the patient prefers. Um, oftentimes capsule is fine. You can also take them in tincture form, which is basically an alcoholic extract of the herb. But you have to be mindful if someone has a substance use, substance use disorder, especially alcohol use disorder, you have to avoid that at all costs because yes. you don't want to trigger a uh, relapse. So um, that in that case, we would do capsule form yeah, or glycerite extract, which is like a sweet extract instead of the alcohol. Mm, I like that. I think capsules are so easy to take. They I've are. taken herbs before in a liquid form. I don't know if these are the same herbs and Oh my gosh, it's disgusting. Yeah. Disgusting. Yeah. All right. I think it is time to wrap this episode up. But before you go, uh, Dr. Stoichev, is there anything you think people with ADHD, women, anyone need to know before you go or any words of wisdom? I would say advocate for yourself as much as you can because unfortunately sometimes we're met with a lot of resistance when it comes to our health um you know oftentimes what we're just given is one option in terms of what we can do and that's medication i've seen medication be life-changing um i've seen medication mm. be also like on the opposite side of the spectrum so if that option doesn't work for you that's okay there's so much more you can do and speaking up for yourself can really um highlight to people that you deserve to get the right treatment that you need. Yes. Um, and that can be psychotherapy, that can be, you know, adequate support around nutrition, sleep health, hormone health, gut health, all of it. Um, they all play such a big part in ADHD symptoms. So advocate for yourself. I love that. Yes. Don't gaslight yourself. And one more, one more. Caffeine and ADHD. Yeah. I, my viewers yes. will kill me if I don't ask about this because <laughs> often I find people who um, love caffeine have ADHD and they're self, you know, medicating because ADHD can stimulate the frontal lobe, helps you concentrate. But then other people say, I have ADHD and it makes me tired. So can you just tell us quickly a bit about caffeine and ADHD? Yes, it's so common in people who have ADHD. Um, I, gosh, it's so common. Um, it's the, so it's a stimulant. So unfortunately it's an unreliable stimulant. And the reason why it is unreliable is because the response from person to person varies so drastically. Some people report they feel more tired after caffeine. If you have ADHD, some people report there's better focus. Other people report there's more anxiety. The reason why is because there is this genetic mutation that, you know, depending on how bad you have it, you metabolize caffeine, caffeine differently. And when that happens is you get a different response to caffeine. So, yeah, so that's why it's so unreliable as a stimulant um, from person to person, I would say. Um, yeah. Very interesting. Thank you yeah. so much. You are honestly a wealth of knowledge and I, I can't wait for us to connect on other topics. And if you're listening to this, Same please way. let us know if you enjoyed this, what you want to hear in future episodes. And Dr. Stoichev, where can people find you if they want to potentially work with you or follow your content? 
So you could find me on TikTok and Instagram uh, at dr.starcheff, um, or you can go for my website, which is drgeorgiestarcheff.com. I'm happy to answer any questions. I love mental health, all things mental health. So me too. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'll link it in the show notes below. But if you love this episode, take a screenshot, tag us on Instagram, and we'll see you in the next one. 